Christianity, Judaism, and Genetics, the fallacy. This presentation is about the fallacy that has been created by Christians who have the tendency of looking at the history of the religion from a racially based point of view. Obviously, they are not aware of what they are doing. By doing this, they are revealing their addiction to their flesh. Please allow me to digress for a few slides. My friends and relatives all know that many years ago I lost my first wife and our three children in a car accident. She lost control of the car as she was taking our children to school. Several times while talking to some of, some of my close relatives, I have had them tell me, you are not the only one who has ever had terrible things happen in your life. They are actually complaining. Unfortunately, they were caught up in a pity party and did not even realize what they were doing. I do not remember of ever complaining or crying on someone's shoulder over the loss of my family. I do know that I had a lot of prayers going up as support. Now, how does this relate to this subject? Well, the subject has to do with genetics and relying on the flesh. I guarantee you that when I lost them, I was not relying on the flesh to keep from losing it. I knew that I must not become bitter, so I immediately began thanking God for the tremendous privilege of ever having such a precious gift, and yes, I was hurting. But thankfulness and praise to God produces healing. Carol, my precious wife now, can tell you that yes, Vern did hurt and the place where I worked even shut down, but I only lost a few days of employment. Please keep this in mind. There was no way I could have ever earned such a precious gift as that lovely family, and I knew that in the very depths of my being. Four caskets lined up in that church. I had to ask that they be kept closed, for I thought it was bad enough without having everyone go up there and view the remains of my people. And yes, they were presentable. At the end of that service, my mother-in-law looked back toward me and said she wished she could see them. I said, Doris, they are not there. Still in tears, she began to smile and said, Burns said they are not there, and he is right. My knowing that has been a tremendous blessing down through the years, and they had all been in church and praying just a few days before. You can't ask for anything better in the way of a memory. I am a very blessed person. As my mother and I walked out of the funeral, the limousines were all full and leaving, so I flagged down one of the hearses. When I got in, I told his driver that Christ was just as real to me as that dashboard, and I hit it with my hand. I have been retired for 20 years now and have never missed a meal unless I wanted to. Yes, I have to watch my coffee drinking, but I still enjoy dessert on occasion and a good joke. I enjoy life. However, I do so want you to see Jesus in the now. His presence is tangible, even though he is spirit. Now think about this. Was Jesus a Jew in a fleshly, genetic sense? No, Jesus was not. It was the Pharisees and their religious descendants that were or Jews. He was of the tribe of Judah. In his ministry, he went out of his way to ask a non-Jew for water. And most Bible students, those who are into that genetic fa fallacy, will point to that woman's genetics as still being Jew Jewish. But in doing so, they are proving they are racist. The word Jew has since been almost universally associated with those people who are followers of Judaism. But nevertheless, they still are a mixed race. The fact is, that woman at the well was not a follower of the Pharisees. Now, Judaism has always had converts. Yes, it is a racist religion, yet historically it has always accepted converts, just as did Israel, all the way back to the time of Moses. 
And when Israel came out of Egypt, there was a mixed multitude that came out with them. It is true that they were strangers, but over a period of time they could become accepted as a part of Israel or Israelites. Again, this too has been questioned on the basis of genetics, and that is also true. But again, this proves that most Christians are racists, for none of those people had previously been a part of Israel. Now, since the word Jew is now used universally to designate all forms of Jewry, I will use it. Now, three religions are associated with Abraham. They are all referred to as being people of the book. They are all Semitics, or Afro-Asiatics, but they have very different cultures. Israelis, or Jews, are not the only Semitics in the world. The genealogical records in the Bible follow the men. In Judaism, it is tied to the women. That fact proves that Judaistic Jews have developed a culture based on their Talmudic religion and not the Bible. However, Talmudic Jews still demand to be recognized as a distinct race of people, and many Christians agree, but that is ridiculous. Most Jews, religious or not, have been influenced by that Talmudic culture. Race, well, here's a definition. It's people who are believed to belong to the same genetic stock. Some biologists doubt that there are important genetic differences between races of human beings. In biology, it is a classification of a related group that is a division of a species and usually has come about as a result of geographical isolation within a species. Judaism is racist, yet Jews are not a true race, but are a culture that has been heavily influenced by that religion. Radical nationalistic Jews believe they are racially superior to all other people and even to other Jews. That is, if another Jew's mother was not a Jew or if they are from an undesirable class, as is happening in Israel. Most people here are not even aware of the class warfare going on in Israel. They have a caste system in Israel. Now, why was Jacob's name changed to Israel? Now, Jacob would not let that angel go, and this is what that angel said. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. That's Genesis 32, 26, and 28. And that definition of Israel can be honestly said to be one who wrestled with God until he received a blessing. And that is, follows the history of that scripture. And what the angel said about Jacob follows Jacob's history. He was one of them that he wrestled in more ways than one. Now compare Jacob with this. And this is talking about Jesus. And he said, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a, a judge who feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said with himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she worry me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them spe speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. That's Luke 18, 1-8. to 8. 
and they had his followers had just asked him about prayer and this was the story that he told but at the end he said God was going to avenge his people speedily a first century context but then he said nevertheless when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on the earth Christ knew something he was very aware of something now, Jacob was, in a sense, wrestling with God. Now, that poor widow woman was also, in a sense, wrestling with that judge. Christ was using her story as an example of how we should pray. One verse says it like this. The fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. But remember what Christ said at the end of that lesson. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on the earth? You know, there's a verse he talks about, Fear not, little flock. He talked about a little flock. The Old Testament talks about a remnant. Now, God had accumulated a lot of experience with the fleshly whims of the human race, and his promises are conditional. Now, what is the moral of those stories? The moral of those stories have little to do with a specific race of people, but with a religion. And please remember that on down in those stories of the 12 children that Jacob fathered also contained religious lessons on morality. Who did the Jews claim was their father? You remember this? He said, Abraham is our father. Well, just like Christians do today, they too were bound by their fleshly inclinations and leaned on their flesh rather than faith in God. Christ and Apostle Paul made this very clear. Christ admitted that those Jews were all of the seed of Abraham, but he also told them that to be a true child of Abraham, you had to act like he did. Apostle Paul said that not all of Israel were Israel. And that principle goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Those Jewish Israelites of the first century openly identified themselves with Abraham who preceded Jacob or Israel. To be a true Israelite, you would also be as righteous as Abel. Well, the Talmud promotes usury. The latest appointment to the Federal Reserve is a woman, and she is a Jew. There have been ten Jews appointed to that position, and it is a privately owned bank that we taxpayers pay a percentage to for every dollar they print. Do you remember Christ turning over the money changers' tables? Do you remember him charging them with devouring widows' houses? Not all has to do with money and banking and so forth. Now their Talmud has encouraged them to become financial wizards and their elite are, God, are good at it. Remember this, it says, Loan to everyone, borrow from none. The Talmud promotes both their excellence and their arrogance. The nation of Israel's existence had depended upon their ability to control propaganda, and Jews had already been perfecting that for hundreds of years. Vice President Joe Biden just recently commanded Jews for being so dominant in the media and for having changed the culture of the United States. This all stems from a political form of religious racism. They have used their financial power to buy favors for centuries. Again, Judaism's elite have excelled in the science of disinformation or propaganda. Those we call them commonly referred to as Jews have been very successful in convincing the Christian community that though Christ may have been a good person, he was mistaken for he thought he would return within the lifetime of many of those who had heard him and seen him, but that did not happen. Do you believe that? Well, millions of Christians since the first century have accepted that lie, 
and do agree that he did not return. So in order to moderate what the, he said, they have, to comp they have compromised the gospel. But what about the nation of Israel? Well, think back to what Apostle Paul said. Not all of Israel is Israel. Then think back to how Christ admitted that those Jews of his day were all truly fleshly descendants of Abraham, yet they were not Abraham's spiritual children. I'm not quoting these passages, but that was their point. To establish a sensible answer as to just what the nation of Israel has to do with Scripture, all of these thoughts have to be kept in mind. Jews, Israelis, and Judaism all rely on their genetic ties to Abraham. In contrast, Christians have been grafted in by faith, and Jews must also rely on faith and not through genetics nor their works. Again, now, there have always been two kinds of Israelites, or two kinds of people who descended from Abraham. Actually, there were two kinds of people portrayed in the Genesis account. One kind thought they had a better idea. The other kind listened to God and obeyed him. Every religious Jew and their religious leaders claimed to be following the Torah. The Torah, given by Moses, is a codified version of God's actual commandments basic moral law. Jews who have tied themselves to the Talmud actually revere it more than the Torah. Now the Talmud is a codification of the same tradition of the elders that Christ mentioned. And they call that their law, practically. They mention the Torah, but that is their law. Christ never referred to those who followed those traditions as being true Israelites, even though they were all, in a genetic sense, children of Abraham. And before his conversion, Apostle Paul had been a strict Pharisee. Now, those Jews almost worshipped their temple and their traditions and revered them above the law of Moses. Now, Judaism is Phariseeism, and they are under the same mode today as they were in the time of Christ. They brag about it, being Pharisees. That's in their writings. Now Christ foretold the destruction of that mosaic system, their temple and nation. That happened, and when those Pharisees what was saw what was coming, they collected their writings and soon began to reorganize and establish a new model of worship that still followed most of their traditions. Since there was no temple where they could sacrifice animals, they began to ordain a new way of killing chickens and beef as a substitute. The closest we non-Jews come to their sacrificing process is when we buy kosher food. Now, all of this has to do with their Jewish culture. The problem Christians have stems from their addiction to the flesh. I hope you get the point. They quickly admit that Jesus is here, but only in spirit, for he is yet to return, and to them that means he must appear in the flesh. That allows them to accept the notion that Israel is a part of God's earthly plan to eventually destroy this wicked planet and create a new one where there will be no more sin. But that is Gnosticism. This physical world and universe is not evil. It's we people who do, are into evil things. Now the creation of Israel is in keeping with that to Israel history, for it is the one that's still based on Phariseeism, but with the addition of a good dose of Zionistic politics added. Now, Judah's judgment fell on the nation of Israel nearly 2,000 years ago, and it will never be rebuilt. What did I just say? There is no nation over there now, and it is filled with Jews and called Israel. So, Vern, what about that? Answer, that is not in any way, shape, or form connected with the Israel of the first century, 
other than by a name associated with a political pseudo-Jewish religion. The religion of the Israel of today has a new language and is being secularized more and more all the time. Its creation was opposed by many religious Jews and their traditions from the start. They've actually created a new language and almost recreated a, a religion over there. Now, to do, today's nation of Israel was established by war and must always be at war for it to continue to exist. Its financial lifeblood is produced by their being perceived as a persecuted people, which is a lie. Israel is becoming more and more secularized. Its religious connection is being downgraded because its leaders are moving against the older, stricter forms of Judaism in that country, even as I write this. Religion, religion the religion of Judaism, was used by Zionists, and again, there was opposition between genuine Judaism and Zionism from the beginning. Zionism cooperated with Hitler in the beginning until they were about to be exposed. As long as Germany's transfer agreement was up and running, they milked it until it was stopped by World War II. And they capitalized on the strife that came about by the over-control of that country created by its alien Jewish elite to promote immigration to Palestine. Now, people my age, I mentioned the transfer agreement, they've never heard of it but they were actually helped, the Jews were, to get to Palestine through that agreement. Now, there are histories written by Jews that support the following who either saw it or researched it. Now, hundreds of other Jews who also did not want to immigrate to Israel, like from Iraq and other places, were killed by Israeli Jews. They blamed the Arabic people where they lived as a way of getting those Jewish families filled with fear and willing to immigrate. I should read that again. They went, there were Jews killing Jews in order to get the Jewish families in other countries filled with fear and willing to immigrate. Now, what happened in Germany was a prelude. Now, these facts cannot be accepted by almost all of my close but brainwashed friends, for they are more willing to accept the words of people living under the control of occupying forces than fact-based history. There's 100,000 military men in Germany, and they are an occupied area, and the people are in the service over there, going around talking to those people, Germans over there, and, oh, yeah, they're... American soldiers are wonderful. Hitler was terrible. Those German soldiers were terrible. So they, uh, they'll take those poor people living over there with guns uh, parked around here and there, and they're being under control. Uh, they take their word above history. You can't accept it. They don't even know about the transfer agreement. Now, Israel, Israel is fulfilling Christ's prophecies, that is nonsense and is anti-Christian to the core. You cannot take the Bible and these historical accounts and use them to support what most Christians refer to as fulfilled prophecy. The New Testament does not support the nation of Israel for there are numerous passages that tell a far different story. God told Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration to listen to his beloved son. Peter had suggested that they build three tabernacles there, one for Christ and two more for those other, those two prophets he had seen talking with Jesus. But God then said, means we are to look at all Old Testament prophecies in keeping with how Christ approached them, for their fulfillment always had conditions tied to them. There they were, there's three of them there, Christ and two prophets. But God said for them to listen to Christ. He wasn't telling them, do not listen to the prophets. But if you're going to listen to the prophets, you listen to Christ. 
to get it straight. That's the point. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Remember that prayer and the little story about the little widow lady? That is a very important statement that Christ made. And it's talking about conditional fulfillment. And you will never see Christ as having returned in keeping with his own words unless you are born again, which is a choice made by a faith you are willing to die for, a conviction. You remember Apostle Paul talking to those people up on Mars Hill? He told them, he's trying to tell them about that unknown God, he said, we're, all of us are in Him. We exist in Him. And if we would, we could feel after Him and find Him. Now he's telling that to pagans. If you feel after Him, you can find Him. Now let me read this again. You will never see Christ as having returned in keeping with His own words unless you are born again, which is a choice made by a faith you are willing to die for, a conviction. Now seeing Israel... And listening to lying prophets on TV, buying their books on prophecy, while failing to read the Bible and not keeping it in the context of what Jesus said will never open your spiritual eyes. Christianity is of another world. It's a spiritual habitation. The spirit realm is where infinite revelation and power resides not by following the propensities of our flesh. That reminds me, i got to tell this story. There's a little boy, excuse me while I halt right here, there's a little boy, his mom sent him to bed, and she wanted him to shut the door, and it was dark in there. He sneaks back and opens the door and says, Mom, I'm scared in here dark and she said well you just go in there and you, get to, you can uh, be okay she said you just pray and talk to Jesus and the little boy says to mama he said but mama I want somebody with skin on him that's the way we are we are so dead in our spirits and our relationship with God and we don't know the book that well and we just sit and get spoon fed in church and uh, we just demand that we have Christ come back because he's going to have skin on him. Now, let me go here. Scriptures are sufficient, but I will add some more information. The stories I will be mentioning will be said to be nothing more than anti-Semitic-based myths. However, true that might be for some of them, things I present, still, for some reason, they still all fit what has been happening. Now, this first item is about an Iraqi who is a religious Jew, and his story started when he was 12 years old. He saw bad things happening to Jews and found out that it was Jews who were killing other Jews and blaming it on non-Jewish Arabic Iraqis. Now, even as a young person, this really bothered him, and as time went on, he began to put down in writing what he had seen and was still seeing. Ben-Gurion Scandals by Name Gilead, and this is what his book is about. How the Haganah and the Mossad eliminated Jews, and both of those are Jewish groups. Uh, some of them are, they're military now, it is now available on Amazon.com. In it, he tells about numbers of things that happened to Jews at the hands of Israelis. He tells of the sinking of a ship called Empire Lifeguard and of a small boat called Egos that was filled with Jewish children from Morocco. These and numbers of other incidents incensed him. He had to be careful and change his name so as to be become accepted as the right kind of a Jew. He saw that these things were being done to advance a politically proper Israel, Israeli form of statehood. They only wanted a certain kind of Jew. And I said, buy his book. It's on Amazon. 
Now, Nam Kaledye still did not connect all the dots. Ben-Gurion kept the lid on the news of the so-called Jewish Holocaust that was being so heavily propagandized and published by the Zionistic control press on the borders of Germany, but it was not being heard in Palestine. Galadi mentions this, but why was that happening? Money. He did not want any money, and I'm talking about Ben Gurion. He did not want any money going from his area of control to help unwanted Jews get to Palestine, and money for that was available. Still, a Holocaust propaganda was direly needed, for it was producing a tremendous inflow, inflow of financial help into his budget. Zionistic Jews were using a Holocaust of other Jews for their agenda. Now, can you hear this? Holocaust numbers have dropped from a high of 9 million to as low as 67,000. Now, the most prevalent and acceptable figure now is around 1.5 million. But you probably have never heard that. I was talking to one of our relatives about some of this. He said, well, I know there's a Holocaust. He said, I see it on television all the time. Well, they always, in our country, talk about 6 million people. And they usually always talk about 6 million Jews being killed over there. Yes, some of these might be myths, but they have been around for a long time, and they do fit. Now, this is a, about this is by a speech by Benjamin Freedom, who is a Jew who converted to Christianity, and this is what he said: The Jews were never, at any time in history, persecuted for their religion. Let me read that again. He says, the Jews were never at any time in history persecuted for their religion. It was their monetary policies that always got them in trouble. He says, always their impact on the political, social, or economic customs and traditions of the community in which they settle. Now, Friedman was an advisor for several presidents in this country. But have you ever heard of him? Well, they put the lid on this guy. In a sense, they've censored whatever he said and did in the past. Now, Benjamin Friedman also said this. He said, do you know why the Jews were riv driven out of England? He said, King Edward I in 1285 drove them out, and they never came back until the Cromwell Revolution. 400 years there wasn't a Jew. But do you, do you know why they were driven out? Because in the Christian faith and the Muslim faith, it's a sin to charge rent for the use of money. In other words, what we call interest is, or usury, is a sin. So the Jews had a monopoly in England, and they charged so much interest, and when the lords and dukes couldn't pay, the Jews foreclosed them. In fact, the lords and, lords and dukes got to where they just killed the Jews to pay off their debt. Now, Hitler was but one of a number of other rulers who did this same thing. Let's see, you don't hear that. You've never heard that. If you did, I'd sort of like to hear from you because I've never heard it before. And it says, now this is, these are quotes. Now, are they myths? Uh, they've got the dates and everything. It says, Hitler will have no war, but he will be forced into it not this year, but later. And that's in the Jewish Emil Ludwig Los Angeles in June 1934. Now, the millions of Jews who lived in America, England, and France, North and South Africa, and not to forget those in Palestine, are determined to bring the war of annihilation against Germany to its final end. Now, this was in the Jewish newspaper, Centerblad Boer, Israelitan, in Netherland on September 13, 1939. Now, all of these can either be found on the web or in books that can still be bought. Now, they're not all in both places. Some of them, you just really have to dig to find them. When Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington, he supposedly said this, and Senator Joseph McCarthy also quoted this in Congress. Remember they talk about McCarthyism? Well, he did find communism, communists in different places. Now, a holy war 
will now begin, this is Cornwallis and McCarthy quoted it, a holy war will now begin on America, and when it is ended, America will supposedly be the citadel of freedom, but her millions will unknowing, unknowingly be the lo loyal subjects of the crown. He goes on. Your churches will be used to teach the Jews religion, and in less than 200 years, the whole nation will be working for divine world government. That government that they believe to be divine will be the British Empire. All religions will be permeated with Judaism without even being noticed by the masses. And they will all be under the invisible, all-seeing eye of the grand architect of Freemasonry. There's a lot of history involved in what this man said when you talk about uh, the British Empire controlling us and you talk about Freemasonry. Well, that's a story all of, of its own. I'm not going into that here. Too, too much into it. Too much to it. Now, can you make the connection? Myths? Well, thanks to the terrible power of our international banks, we have forced the Christians into wars without number. Wars have a special value for Jews, since Christians massacre each other and make more room for us Jews. Wars are the Jews' harvest. The Jew banks grow fat on Christian wars. Over 100 million Christians have been swept off the face of the earth by wars, and the end is not yet. Now, this was supposedly said by Rabbi Richhorn, speaking at the funeral of Grand Rabbi Simeon ben Judah in 1869. Now, that's way back there. Now, this has been quoted numerous times over the years, but will this video be allowed to stay on YouTube? Will it be up there? They've banned a lot of stuff on YouTube. I was told just recently by a friend that if I'm ever investigated, they will find child pornography on my computer. And as for this quote, part of this was quoted in a book written by Henry Ford Sr. He wrote a big lengthy book on uh, the subject of the Jews way back, and it hurt his business for a while. In fact, he used to talk about them in his newspaper, and he quit. He got threatened. Now, we are not denying and are not afraid to confess this war, World War II, is our war, and that it is waged for the liberation of Jewry. Stronger than all fronts together is our front, that of Jewry. We are not only giving this war our financial support, on which the entire war production is based, we are not only providing our full propaganda power, power, which is the moral energy that keeps this war going, the guarantee of victory is predominantly based on weakening the enemy forces, on destroying them in their own country within the resistance. And we are the Trojan horses and the enemy's forces. Fortress. We are the Trojan horses and the enemy's fortress. Thousands of Jews living in Europe constitute their principal factor, the, the principal factor, in the destruction of our enemy. There, they are our front, is a fact, and the most valuable aid for victory. Now, people think this is a myth, but listen, this is supposedly said by James Wiesman, President of the World Jewish Congress, in a speech on December 3rd, 1942 in New York City. I'll let you worry about that. I've dug and dug. Now you can see what you can do to see if I'm telling the truth or if this is truth or myth or what. Now listen to this guy. He says, some call it Marxism. I call it Judaism. Now that's in the American Bulletin. Rabbi Stephen Wise on May 5th, 1935. Uh, now this, there is much in the fact of Bolshevism itself, in the fact that so many Jews are Bolshevists, in the fact that the ideals of Bolshevism at many points are consonant with the finest ideals of Judaism. Now, that was written in the Jewish Chron Chronicle, April 4th, 1919. But the communist soul is the soul of Judaism. 
Hence it follows that just as in the Russian Revolution, the triumph of communism was the triumph of Judaism, so also in the triumph of fascism will triumph Judaism. Now look, he doesn't say that uh, the fascism is the soul of Judaism, but they said the communist soul is the soul of Judaism. But it, this is supposedly said, and it mentioned a program for the Jews of humanity by Rabbi Harry Watton on page 143 and 144. Now, that fellow's writings is on the web, Harry Watton. You can do a search. You have to go to certain places, though, to find this stuff. It's, I don't know if the Google will bring it up or not. Now, his God's intention will be realized through bloody struggles, wars, and revolutions. The present social order will be destroyed together with all institutions that are bound up with the present social order. State capitalism and fascism will take the place of the present social order. Now, this is a program for the Jews. And that, again, is by Rabbi Harry Watton, and it's on page 225. Now, the time will come when all Christians will become mature. They will all embrace Judaism, and they will all justify themselves by deeds. Then the Christians will become Jews. That's another one in the same book by Harry Watton, and it's on page 174. Now, this is the last so-called myth I will refer to. In Germany, the Jews occupy the principal riles and are first-rate revolutionaries. They are writers, philosophers, poets, orators, publicists, and bankers, and on their heads and in their hearts are all the weight of ancient ignominy ways. You know, it's on their heads. They will one day be terrible for Germany, probably followed by a moral terrible for them. Now, this is Roji Ron in 1861. That's way back there. And Metternich. And I think it was reprinted in uh, parts of eight, in another one, 1849, The tra Trail of the Serpent. And it says, Inquire Within, Miss Stoddard on page 93. Now, that one's uh, not out there. Very, you won't find that very easy. Now, this history has been hidden and will be thought of as being a myth. See, I'm not going to tell you this is a myth. I just, that's a, you can think it is. I don't know if it is or not. I really wonder. Now, the militancy of the fascist movements that arose in Germany, Spain, Italy, and other European countries in the 1920s and 1930s was, in essence, a response to the undisguised Bolshevik goal of dominating Europe. Now, one of the earliest Russian revisionists of World War II history was Pirate Grigorenko, a Soviet Army Major General and highly decorated war veteran who taught at the Fruns Military Academy and was the first leading Soviet figure to advance the arguments which became well known during the 1980s and 90s on Stalin's preparation for aggressive war against Germany. It says they were well known. I never heard of them before. He's talking about Stalin was preparing an aggressive war against Germany? Never heard of it. Just prior to the German attack on June 22, 1941, more than half of the Soviet forces were in the area near and west of Beliostok, that is, in an area deep in Polish-occupied territory, and Grigionko pointed out that Soviet military forces vastly outnumbered German forces in 1941. Now, I, I talk to people on the web, on uh, YouTube and stuff, and they do not agree with this at all, but whatever. It is basically irrelevant whether one regards the war that broke out in June 1941 between Germany and Soviet Russia as a war of aggression, a preventative war, or a counterattack for each side. And then note, that's the writer, and others contend this was a life or death struggle to decide which worldview 
and way of life would prevail in Europe. Would it be atheistic, internationalist communism, or the Gregorious Christian civilization of the West? They said it was a life or death struggle to decide which worldview and way of life would be for prevail in Europe, atheistic internationalist communism or the Burgoyce Christian civilization of the West. Now, this is this is a, this book's out there is from Operation Barbosa and the Russian historians dispute by Wolfgang Strauss, a Munich Herbig, 1998. Now, I don't know if you can find that on Amazon.com or not. It'd be worth a try. And there's quite a bit of material. There's several books written from this side, from this point of view. Now, the opening of the World War II Russian archives is why their historians now say these things. Nolt has strongly suggested that Hitler's wartime treatment of the Jews might legitimately be regarded as a defensive response by Hitler to the threat of Bolshevik mass murder of the Germans. And in a 1980 lecture, he said, it is hard to deny, now this is this writer, he said, it's hard to deny that Hitler had good reason to be convinced of his enemy's determination to annihilate long before the first information about the events in Auschwitz became public. Hoffman mentions the response to this by prominent Germans and columnists. Now, in every case, as all, this is talking about a writer discussing these things. He said, in every case, he wanted to write about it, and he said, in every case, he was told that even if Zorov is correct and Hitler's attack indeed preceded Stalin's by weeks, this must not be acknowledged public publicly because it would exonerate Hitler. This is typical, says Hoffman, of the immoral attitude that prevails in Germany in their egotism, he adds, these Germans do not realize that they are, in effect, demanding that Russians accept the propaganda lies of the Stalin era. Strauss contrasts the very different attitudes of Germans and Russians towards 20th century history and the role of historical revisionism. Whereas Germans are endued with a national masochistic guilt complex about their collectively evil past, which was instilled during the post-war occupation as part of Allied re-education campaign and reinforced ever since in their media and by their political leaders, Russians are much more free and open about their communist past, largely because they have not been occupied by foreign conquerors and their media and educational system has not come under the control of outsiders. That's what I think about these people that's been on duty over there in Germany. Our boys over there, 100,000 of them over there. Uh, and Germany does not want to admit that they've been brainwashed. And they want to keep on believing that Hitler was the boogeyman. So... And boy, we went over there and did everything we could to get rid of uh, uh, anything left over from Germany, uh, from Hitler. Boy, we purged that place of their history and everything else and demonized the German people. Now, Christians hold the key to all of this in their hands, but only if they open it and read it and do their best to make sense of it by keeping it in context and using logic. They must quit relying on their innate fleshly responses, their emotions. Listen to Apostle Paul's preface to Romans chapter 7 that is absolutely contradicted by an evil, twisted approach to what he said on down. Now listen carefully. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work on our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Romans 7.5 when we were in the flesh. I hope you can hear that. When we were, past tense, in the flesh. We're not supposed to be walking around in the flesh. We're to be walking in the Spirit. Read Romans 6 and 8. We are not to be ruled by some evil flesh, fleshly interpretation of scriptures that countermand what Christ said about his soon first century return where he would then inhabit the hearts 
and lives of his righteous followers. I have to read that again. We are not to be ruled by some evil fleshly interpretation of scriptures to countermand what Christ said about his soon first century return, where he would then inhabit the hearts and lives of his righteous followers. Oh, that's so important. That is so important. Christ knew who those Pharisees were, but Christians take what he said out of context and deny they were judged. Now, God is due praise, for he is the benevolent creator, so that must happen, for it is demanded by justice. The very stones will cry out if people don't praise him. Now, if we fail, then we become as salt that is worthless, and we will be cast out and trodden underfoot. Now, that has happened before, and it will keep happening again and again until a higher percentage of Christians truly love him and obey him by having chosen to open their spiritual eyes by faith. Now, untold millions have been tortured and killed, not raptured. That catching away or lifting up is probably tied to the euphoria that was a result of the Christian physical deliverance from the terrible persecution mentioned in Acts. Now, because Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, those days were shortened. People, Christian church actually don't even know what the book of Acts is about. And when you talk about, we all use the word rapture, well, that's where we get the word enraptured from. You know, you look at your wife and you're sometimes you're enraptured. Well, when those people saw what was happening to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem and the temple and everything, I'm sure they became enraptured and they were edified. And they were lifted up before the world. That was a praise to God because of what Christ had said was going to happen was happening. I don't know. I hope somebody could hear this. This is the end of this presentation. Check my other presentations on YouTube under William Vermanson or Mr. Piskey. My prayers go with you.